now like to introduce our international keynote speaker, Dr. Sarah Kostelik. Dr. Kostelik is the Executive Director of the National Indian Child Welfare Association, which NICWA, the most comprehensive source of information and advocacy regarding American Indian child welfare, and the only national American Indian organisation focused specifically on the tribal capacity to prevent and respond to child abuse and neglect. Sarah is a Lutic, an, en an enrolled member of the native village of Uz Uzinki. She joined NICWA in 2011 as an integral part of the lib deliberative four-year executive transition plan for NICWA's funding executive director and previous international keynote speaker for the SNAKE conference, Terry Cross, we all remember Terry, and became executive director in January 2015. Please welcome Dr. S Sarah Kostelik to the stage, everybody. You're very welcome. Chamai, good morning. I'm so honored to be here with you this morning, and I thank the Creator for bringing us all here safely together. And I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal peoples on whose traditional lands we're meeting. In my language, we say Koyana. I'd also like to thank the Snake Leadership, National Voice for Our Children, for inviting me to share my experience and to learn with you and from you. Finally, I'd like to honor my parents and my teachers for giving me the shoulders to stand on and weaving the path of opportunity that has brought me to this day. I'm a Lutik, a citizen of the native village of Yuzinki near Kodiak, Alaska, and I serve as the executive director of the National Indian Child Welfare Association, or NICWA. We support the safety, health, and spiritual strength of American Indian Alaska Native children and youth and we work to eliminate child abuse and neglect by strengthening our families, our tribes, and the laws that protect them. We build the capacity of tribal governments, 567 in the United States, to prevent child maltreatment. We also serve First Nations communities in Canada. I was taught that to lead is a privilege and a sacrifice. In many Native communities, certain leadership opportunities are bestowed with an apology. The preemptive apology is a recognition of the burden of the responsibility and what it will require of the beneficiary. For me, the acceptance of leadership responsibility is an opportunity to balance urgency with patience and to couple strategy with passion in stewarding a culturally based organization that strives to strengthen the well being of Native children and families. Like many, like many leaders, my family was affected by the helping systems that I'm actively working to change. That lived experience keeps me leading from the center, and it's why I have so much emotion this morning given the presentation that I'm following. Hong Papa Lakota Chief Sitting Bull said, let us put our minds together and see what we can make for our children. This morning, I'm gonna share with you some of our recent experiences in the United States and our fight to protect our American Indian Alaska Native children from unnecessary removal from their families and communities and to keep them connected to their culture and confident in their indigenous identity. I'm pleased to be able to share this with you so early in this SNAKE conference, as I hope it gives us time for informal conversations about the US experience and about your insights about how we can work together to improve the well being of indigenous children across the world. Just as a technical note about language, I use the terms Indian and Native interchangeably to refer to the indigenous population in the lower 48 states in Alaska, 
because Native Hawaiians had been treated pretty differently by our federal policy, um, the remarks that I'm making today unfortunately don't pertain to them because they don't yet benefit from some of the same protections that our indigenous peoples in other areas of the U.S. do. So I know we're running a little bit behind, so I'm going to try to speak a little bit more quickly and maybe um, truncate some of my remarks. Uh, but of course, I'll be glad to, to meet with you and to share with you in the other sessions here. But uh, I'll try to do my part to get us closer to being on time. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of historical context. And as you know, unfortunately, our indigenous people in the United States have much in common with you here in Australia. The formal child welfare system in the U.S. was established about 100 years ago. In Indian country, however, the formal child welfare system wasn't established until much later. It wasn't until 1978, just 39 years ago, that the Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA, acknowledged the authority of tribal governments to be involved in the lives of their member children. But let's step back to the ways that our communities kept children safe and supported caregivers with extended families before contact. Prior to contact with European immigrants, tribal child-rearing practices and beliefs allowed a natural system of protection to flourish. Traditional Indian beliefs reinforced that all things had a spiritual nature that demanded respect, including children. Not only were children respected, but they were also taught to respect others. Extraordinary patience and tolerance marked the methods that were used to teach Indian children self-discipline. Behavior management or obedience was obtained through relationship and connectedness and fear and respect of something much greater than the punishment of a parent. At the heart of this natural system were beliefs, traditions, and customs involving extended family with clearly delineated roles and responsibilities. Child-rearing responsibilities were often divided between extended family members and community members. It was common for a family member or designated tribal elder to take in children who'd lost their parents. The existence of extended family networks meant that children were never left without care and could hardly be called orphans after losing parents. In fact, foster care, Guardianship and adoption are all modern terms for ancient practices. In this way, the protection of children in the tribe was the responsibility of all people in the community. Child abuse and neglect were rarely a problem in traditional tribal settings because of these traditional beliefs and the natural safety net. As European migration to the United States increased, traditional tribal practices and child rearing were often lost as federal programs sought to systematically assimilate people. Efforts to civilize the population were almost always focused on Indian children. It began as early as 1609 when the Virginia Company, in a written document, authorized the kidnapping of Indian children for the purpose of civilizing the local Indian populations through the use of Christianity. The Civilization Fund Act passed by Congress in 1819 authorized grants to private agencies, primarily churches, to establish programs in tribal communities to civilize the Indian. From the 1860s through the 1970s, the federal government and private agencies established large boarding schools far from reservations and tribal lands where Indian children were placed involuntarily. Indian agents had the authority to withhold food and clothing from parents who resisted sending their children away. The boarding schools operated under harsh conditions. Children were not able to use their languages or traditional customs, were required to wear uniforms and cut their hair, and were subjected to military discipline and standards. These assimilation policies and many others facilitated the breakdown of the natural tribal system of caring for children and made it necessary to implement a formal child welfare system. The federal response was to invite non-natives through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and state social service agencies to take over the responsibility for the protection of native children. In the 1960s and 1970s, the child welfare system became yet another avenue that state and federal government used to force the assimilation of children. It was during this era that the Child Welfare League of America, a membership organization of public and private child welfare agencies, 
and the Children's Bureau, a federal government agency, sponsored the Indian Adoption Project, which moved hundreds of Native children from their homes and communities out west and placed them in non-Native homes on the East Coast. At the same time, Native children were being removed from their homes by state child welfare systems and placed in non-Native homes in large numbers. The outcome of these assimilation efforts is heightened risk factors for child maltreatment in Native communities. These policies left generations of parents and grandparents who were subjected to the prolonged institutionalization and who do not have positive role models of family life and family discipline. Boarding schools and relocation efforts resulted in the destruction of kinship networks and traditional understandings of child rearing and protection damaging the natural safety net that was in place traditionally. It was not until 1978, with the passage of ICWA, that the federal government acknowledged the inherent sovereign right of tribal governments and the critical role that they play in protecting their children and maintaining their families. Meaning that for two centuries, the United States usurped tribes' rights to care for their families further eroding the traditional and natural child protection systems of tribal communities. The Indian Child Welfare Act was enacted to provide much needed federal oversight to protect American Indian and Alaska Native children and families from the biased and sometimes abusive practices of state and private child welfare agencies and state courts. Prior to the passage of ICWA, a study conducted by the Association on American Indian Affairs in 1969 and again in 1974 revealed that 25 to 35 percent, a quarter to a third, of all Native children had been removed from their homes and 85 percent of those children were placed in non-Indian homes often far from their tribal communities and extended families, and that was intentional. ICWA provided federal requirements for state and private agencies and state courts to follow when working with Native children and families involved in state or private child custody proceedings. In addition to the new federal requirements, ICWA recognized tribes' inherent sovereignty to be involved in matters involving their tribal citizens, even in state court and also authorized small grant programs to support on and off reservation child welfare programs. Some key requirements of the Indian Child Welfare Act include requiring notice to a child's tribe of custody proceedings in state courts and allowing tribes to intervene in state custody proceedings as a legal party. Allowing the child's tribe to petition the state court to transfer state proceedings to tribal court requiring full faith and credit of tribal court orders in state court proceedings, requiring active efforts be made to prevent the removal of Native children from their families and help them reunify with their families after removal, requiring placement of Native children in foster care, guardianship, and adoption according to placement preferences that emphasize placement with extended families and with tribal homes requiring higher evidentiary standards than states typically use to place Native children in foster care or to terminate the rights of parents, and requiring the testimony of expert witnesses, preferably with tribal heritage and familiarity with the tribal child rearing uh, practices before a, Native children can be, before a Native child can be removed and placed in foster care or their parents have their parental rights terminated. ICWA provided a small pool of resources and a platform for improved tribal state relationships because states needed to partner with tribes in order to meet these requirements. In 1979, the first Indian Child Welfare grants were available to tribes. They are competitive grants that about a third of tribal governments received. In 1996, just 20 years ago, the Bureau of Indian Affairs finally guaranteed some minimal level of child welfare funding for all tribes. Last year, in 2016, the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the U.S. Department of the Interior published the first ever comprehensive regulations and revised earlier guidelines initially published in 1979 and in 2015. 
The new regulations address the implementation of ICWA's statutory requirements and are legally binding. The revised guidelines provide some additional guidance regarding the implementation of ICWA's requirements, but are not legally binding. This full set of federal guidance is now providing clarity and uniformity in how ICWA should be implemented that was previously not available during the first 38 years of implementation of the law. So what are tribes doing today in the area of child welfare? They're addressing the effects of colonization. They're taking back control of child welfare from other entities who were doing it for them and not very well. And they're revitalizing traditions and customs, including natural helping systems, to support families and to protect children. Under the administration of President Barack Obama, we experienced unprecedented federal partnership to improve ICWA implementation. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Department of the Interior, and Department of Justice formed an interagency work group to develop and review the guidelines and regulations I mentioned. After the regulations were released, the Department of Interior held joint trainings around the country for states and tribes together to hear the same message. The Department of Justice filed amicus briefs in ICWA cases, including cases alleging that ICWA was unconstitutional. Health and Human Services developed a regulation finally requiring state collection of data elements about ICWA-eligible children, so that by 2019, we will actually have a picture of how our children are faring in state child welfare systems and whether states are complying with the required protections for Native children. Moreover, to sustain this work into the next administration, the Departments of the Interior, Justice, and Health and Human Services signed a Memorandum of Understanding to institutionalize their joint work to strengthen ICWA implementation and compliance. Although the current administration is reviewing some of these policies, potentially with the intent to weaken or withdraw them, I felt like it was important today to highlight just some of the key practice issues around ICWA guidelines in hopes that the information may be helpful to you and your efforts here. Um, I was planning to talk about four different aspects of the regulations, but given our time, I think I'm going to focus mostly on active efforts. That sounds like something that will be uh, the most useful for our conversations here. Uh, just for context, in February 2015, after a formal tribal consultation process, public listening sessions, and a public comment period, the Department of Interior, Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs released revised ICWA guidelines for state courts and agencies effective immediately. These superseded and replaced the state court guidelines from 1979. They expanded application from just state courts to state courts and any placing agency, public or private. While they're non-binding, they have persuasive authority that was informed by 36 years of case law. The guidelines also specifically mention that some of the content was drawn from state ICWA laws, which has done much to clarify implementation of ICWA state by state in the years since the federal ICWA was passed, especially in the last decade when we've seen tremendous growth in the number of state ICWA laws. To coincide with the December 2016 date of the legally binding regulations, the Department of Interior again released updated guidelines. The purpose of the guidelines is to clarify minimum federal standards. Notably, where applicable state or other federal law provides higher standard of protection to parents, those laws are to be followed. The guidelines also, to endeavor, also endeavor to ensure compliance consistent with the language of ICWA, the intent of ICWA, and the canons of statutory construction. You may ask, why are all of these policies, the regulations, and the guidelines necessary? As the guidelines acknowledge, since ICWA's passage in 1978, implementation and interpretation of the Act has been inconsistent across states and sometimes can even vary significantly within a state. This significant variation in applying ICWA's statutory terms and protections um, means that a Native child and her parents in one state can receive different rights and protections under federal law than a Native child and her parents in a different state. This disparate application of ICWA, based on where a child resides, creates significant gaps in ICWA protections and is contrary to the uniform minimum federal standards intended by Congress. 
The disproportionate number of Native children in state child welfare systems and disparate treatment of Native families bear this out. Even today, when a judge is presented with two families, one Native, one not Native, with exactly the same set of circumstances, the Native children are three times more likely than other children to be removed from their families. In state courts, Native children are four times more likely than white children to be removed from their homes at the first encounter. Native families are most likely to have children removed from their home as a first resort and least likely to be offered family support interventions intended to keep families together. The result of disparate treatment is overrepresentation in the child welfare system. Nationwide, Native children are overrepresented in foster care at a rate 2.7 times greater than their proportion in the general population. This means that although Native children are just 0.9% of all children in the U.S., they're 2.1% of all children who are placed outside their homes in foster care. Yet, as we previously noted, there's significant variation by state. So I wanted to just share very quickly a few data points from several different states. In Minnesota, the disproportionality rate is 17. Native children are 1.4% of the state child population, but 23.9% of children in foster care. In my home state of Alaska, the disproportionality rate is 2.6. Native children are 17.8% of the state child population, 17.8%, but 46.6% of the foster care population. And finally, in South Dakota, one of the most egregious states, uh, the disproportionality rate is 3.7, with Native children representing 12.9% of the state child population, but 47.9%, nearly half of the foster care population. So the ICWA guidelines are necessary to change the structural issues and to address individual behaviors associated with disproportionality. They're necessary to protect children's rights to be with their families and to know their culture rights that have often been and still continue to be violated. To ensure that states consider tribal values when working with tribal children and families. To empower tribal governments to provide care and services for their member children in culturally appropriate ways. To expand the pool of resources available to children. To protect the best interests and unique needs of Native children. And to fulfill the federal trust responsibility to tribes. So again, I'm just going to quickly touch on, on active efforts um, because I think this is one of the most significant clarifications that the guidelines have made. Um, so the guidelines have clarified what constitutes active efforts to prevent removal, allowing a child to remain at home safely with her family, surrounded by services, and to reunify. Under federal law, the standard for non-Indian children is reasonable efforts. Reasonable efforts to prevent removal include things like making a referral, managing a case, meeting minimum policy standards, and providing mainstream support services. Active efforts, however, require a higher level of service and engagement. Rather than just making a referral, recommending that a parent attend a parenting class that happens on Tuesday night, for example, Active efforts would include arranging childcare services, transportation, and helping the family and extended family engage. Active engagement might sound something like this. There's a positive Indian parenting class offered at the Minneapolis American Indian Center on Tuesday evenings. Here's a description of the class. It draws on the strengths of historic Indian child rearing patterns and blends traditional values with contemporary skills. Storytelling, cradle boards, harmony, lessons of nature, behavior management, and use of praise are discussed. Does that sound like a helpful class? Do you have a schedule conflict? They provide a meal and childcare on site. Do you have a way to get there? Do you think your partner might be available too? See the difference in the approach? Can you imagine the difference a family feels when they're engaged with active efforts? when the social worker is a collaborative problem solver, a partner? Instead of just managing the case, active efforts require proactively engaging in diligent coursework, casework, follow-up, visits, and service provision, 
It inherently requires working closely with the family and the tribe. Instead of meeting minimum policy standards, it requires creatively meeting the needs of the family involved. More face-to-face -face contact and engagement than required by policy, not just making phone calls. Rather than just the provision of mainstream services, it requires culturally appropriate services, which states may not have, but need to make an effort to provide. And while reasonable efforts would require updating the tribe or tribal social worker, early engagement that may drop off as the case goes on, active engagement requires seeking service and case management suggestions and actively co-case managing where the tribe has available personnel. This is engaged updating. This is a full partnership. This is the state or county worker saying to the tribal worker, is this the right decision? Do you have additional information? Did I miss something? It's co-case management. Active efforts are a critical piece of what determines whether a child will ever have the opportunity to go home or will end up somewhere else. A judge has to make a determination where active efforts made before making a change in placement or to more moving to terminate parental rights. So this has implications for training judges also. The active efforts requirement reflects Congress's recognition of the particular history of the treatment of Indian children and families. Many Indian children were removed from their homes because of poverty, joblessness, substandard housing, and other situations that could be remediated through the provision of social services. The active efforts requirement helps to ensure that parents receive the services they need so that they can be safely reunified with their children. The active efforts requirement is designed primarily to ensure that services are provided that would permit the Indian child to remain or to be reunited with her parents wherever possible and helps to protect against unwarranted removals by ensuring that parents who are or who may readily become fit parents are provided with the services necessary to retain or regain custody of their child. This is viewed by 18 national child welfare organizations in the U.S. as part of the gold standard of what services should be provided in all child welfare proceedings, not just those involving Indian children. Under the guidelines, there is no federal definition of active efforts, but the guidelines provide 11 specific examples of what constitutes active efforts. Engaging the child, parents, extended family, and tribe perhaps in a vehicle like a family team meeting. Taking the steps necessary to keep siblings together. Identifying services and actively assisting parents in obtaining the services. Identifying, notifying, and inviting representatives of the tribe to participate in the case. And diligent search for extended family for assistance and placement, which is consistent with other federal child welfare laws in the US. So the guidelines go on to uh, clarify very specific examples of things that will be helpful, uh, standards that judges should be looking for, questions that judges can, can use as a checklist uh, in court to ensure that agencies have made uh, active efforts to keep families together, uh, to prevent removal, and to help reunify when a child has to be removed. Um, so I'll just skip quickly to the end here. Um, as I've described in the last three years, we've experienced a lot of significant policy development and clarification about minimum federal standards and practice guidance for protecting Native children. But even as we celebrate important progress for the well-being of our children, we're facing backlash. We've seen a torrent of litigation challenging the constitutionality of ICWA, the authority of the Bureau of Indian Affairs to issue the ICWA guidelines, the validity of state equal laws and child placement outcomes in sensationalized individual custody cases. In July, an ICWA case was petitioned for cert before our U.S. Supreme Court. The third case, ICWA case, petitioned for cert in the last five years. In October, we'll know more about whether the court will accept the case. We hope they won't. These well-orchestrated attacks against ICWA across the country are sobering. Our opposition comes from private adoption attorneys and agencies, as well as anti-tribal groups and conservative think tanks. 
One single think tank, the Goldwater Institute, is a party to six anti-ICWA cases at state Supreme Court, appellate court, or federal district court levels. The same organization has filed amicus briefs in three other ICWA cases. Their clear goal is to weaken or overturn ICWA and the important protections it provides to keep children with their families. The goal of weakening or striking down ICWA is also seen as the first domino in the very foundation of federal Indian law. This anti-ICWA legal strategy has been compounded by a strategic media campaign designed to inflame the public, especially in individual high-profile child custody cases. The resulting media firestorm perpetuates misinformation at a staggering rate, and the actors behind these theatrics are involved in case after case. Yet, NICWA stands up to these challenges. We issue press statements and correct the misinformation being spread about the law and about individual cases. We convene partners to develop unified messaging and field numerous media calls and interviews. We relentlessly call out irresponsible journalism, and we've developed several personal ICWA story videos that help to educate the media and the public about the importance of ICWA. And with legal partners, we participate in litigation strategy and support the filing of amicus briefs. As indigenous peoples, we all carry the legacy of the intentional dismantling of our families by government and religious groups. But today and together, we work toward a different future for our children. We are united in our effort to withstand the present day attacks. At NICWA, we believe that every Native child must have access to community-based, culturally appropriate services that help them grow up safe, healthy, and spiritually strong, free from abuse, neglect, sexual exploitation, and the damaging effects of substance abuse. Creator put us here to protect and to nurture our children. We have a sacred responsibility and our children cannot afford to wait. Kriana.